Welcome to the video, The Complete Collapse of the Psychotherapy Paradigm. What else changes when we know that techniques have no inherent power? My name is Dr. Stephen Bacon. I'm a clinical psychologist in Santa Barbara, California, and I've spent the past decade writing books and researching exactly how psychotherapy works. The privilege knowledge problem. Privilege knowledge refers to the idea that each profession is characterized by its unique privilege knowledge, the knowledge that is owned by the profession, the knowledge that must be mastered to succeed at the profession. Privilege knowledge includes psychotherapy techniques, but also consists of everything related to mental health, concepts like diagnosis, prognosis, etiology, and pathology. The same arguments that hold for the inherent power of techniques are applicable to privilege knowledge. Trained and experienced therapists have access to privilege knowledge and the untrained inexperienced don't. Hence, lack of training and experience effects show that psychotherapy's privilege knowledge is unrelated to outcomes. Exploring the privilege knowledge finding. Frankly, the idea that every single thing written about psychotherapy, the thousands of books, articles, and research studies, are all useless doesn't feel right. Some of it must be true and useful. Take restful sleep as good for our mental health as an example. This statement seems valid and helpful and is often present in interventions. The problem here is that the sleep statement isn't really part of our privileged knowledge. It's actually common knowledge in that everyone, including beginning psychotherapist, already knows it. This common knowledge, privilege knowledge confusion is true of lots of ideas that we use in psychotherapy, such as socialization is good, exercise is helpful for most people, and many people feel better if they get a dog or learn to stand up for themselves. In some, we find ourselves in the awkward position of saying that the useful information in psychotherapy is part of common knowledge and our privileged ideas, like what is a schizoaffective disorder, are knowledge that is unrelated to outcomes. To best understand techniques without inherent power and the irrelevance of psychotherapy's privileged knowledge, it can be useful to explore a metaphor about exorcism. Imagine a culture that believes that mental health problems occur as a result of possession by malevolent spirits. The ill person seeks an exorcist who is expert at diagnosing which spirit is present and what ritual will expel it. The individual undergoes the exorcism, they feel the spirit depart, and their condition improves. Further imagine that there are a few exorcists who know that the spirits are constructs, that they don't actually exist. They continue to treat the individuals and continue to have successes, even though they know the spirits are imaginary and the exorcisms are rituals powered by beliefs. Techniques versus rituals. The standard exorcists would believe they are using techniques with inherent power. The awakened exorcists would understand that the interventions are actually rituals. The rituals are powered by client beliefs. They work because they are removing a mental construct, the imagined malevolent spirit. A mental construct is established by beliefs, and therefore, it can be removed by something that changes those beliefs. If the spirit was real, it couldn't be banished by reliefs and rituals. Expelling it would require an exorcism that had inherent power. For example, if a client has a personality change, due to a brain tumor, they would require a technique with inherent power, surgery. If they have a depression due to poor self-esteem, they can be cured by a psychotherapeutic ritual. Privileged knowledge as a construct. The privileged knowledge of the exorcist is the knowledge that allows them to discern what kind of spirit has possession and what specific practice will expel that kind of spirit. Since the spirits don't exist, all of the privileged knowledge is simply an invention 
that explains why the client feels poorly. Since all around us believe in the same explanations, they feel real, not fabricated. Given that in truth, these explanations are fabricated, it's easy to understand why they'd be unrelated to improving outcomes. As an example of the fluidity of such explanations, a beginning exorcist could make up their own spirit description and their own exorcism. As long as they were convincing, it would work as well as the real exorcisms. In psychotherapy, these kinds of inventors are called system developers. Famous developers include Freud, Jung, and Carl Rogers. Fictions, Fabrications, and Constructs One of the most famous living psychotherapists, Irving Yalom, has this to say about the constructed nature of psychotherapy's privileged knowledge. The superego, the id, the ego, the archetypes, the idealized and the actual selves, the pride system, the self-system and the dissociated system, the masculine protest, parent, child, and adult ego states. None of these really exist. They are all fictions, all psychological constructs created for semantic convenience, and they justify their existence only by virtue of their explanatory power. Once it is invented and we read about it in books, we act as if it's real. Yalom, who is apparently immune to this kind of social endorsement, understood the constructed nature of privileged knowledge even before the research results became clear. The privileged knowledge perspective of another culture. It's always easiest to understand what is constructed in any given culture when one looks at it from the outside, from the perspective of a different culture. Examine this quote about the validity of Western psychology from the viewpoint of the Maori people. Psychology has created the mass abnormalization of Maori people by virtue of the fact that Maori people have been recipients of English-defined labels and treatments. Clinical psychology is a form of social control and offers no more truth about the realities of Maori people's lives than a regular reading of the horoscope page in the local newspaper. Obviously, La Sante is describing a form of cultural imperialism. He also joins Yalom in seeing psychotherapy's privileged knowledge as constructed and is not based in reality. The Awakened Exorcist and Interventions as Rituals We can also understand the differences between rituals and techniques by imagining exorcisms from the perspective of the awakened exorcist. The standard exorcist begins by figuring out which spirit is in possession and which technique is designed to move, remove that spirit. The awakened exorcist begins with the client and tries to understand what the client believes about their own suffering, their spirit, and what would cure them. The standard therapist applies the selected technique carefully and completely and is afraid to vary from the defined approach, fearing that the technique might lose its power. The awakened therapist designs a ritual that is individualized for that client. They are unafraid to adapt the ritual in the midst of the process if that will enhance client beliefs and expectancies. Translating the exorcism metaphor into Western psychotherapy. The awakened therapist understands that human suffering is real, but viewing and discussing that suffering in terms of diagnostic categories, such as schizotypal, cyclothymic disorder, and borderline personality, fails to enhance outcomes. The awakened psychotherapist might continue to use diagnostic categories if that helped the client in some way, but feels free to modify any diagnosis if that is more useful. This would especially be true for certain diagnoses that are associated with stigma and negative prognoses. Given that most clients frame everything in terms of Western psychology, the awakened therapist will default to the frames and interventions that are most comfortable for the client, but they will be free to adapt the explanations and interventions in any way that helps the client, knowing that conforming to standard definitions fails to enhance outcomes. While all therapists attempt to engender hope and positive belief in their clients, 
technique-centric therapists pay much less attention to this factor than client-centric therapists. Diagnoses become adaptable, as do interventions. Imagine a client who presents with the news that they have been diagnosed by a previous therapist as a borderline. They have researched the diagnosis and discovered that it implies that they will have great difficulty with relationships and may never get better. A standard therapist might reassure the client that they will work with them for the many years that it will take to treat their condition. The constructionist therapist can respond with something like, I agree that you are a borderline, but fortunately you are a special type of borderline. In your type, only a part of your psyche, one particular ego state, meets borderline criteria. Interestingly, you have lots of other high-functioning parts as well. You'll be pleased to know that this special category of borderline has a much better prognosis, particularly because you can access the, re the strengths inherent in the other parts. The redefinition of the diagnosis not only enhances the client's mood, it engenders a level of hope and optimism. Moreover, the constructionist therapist unfettered by the limiting assumptions of the diagnosis, can entertain a better prognosis and is relatively free to develop interventions that are individualized for the client. The research analyses have truly horrible implications for psychotherapy as we know it. We would need to admit that licensed trained therapists get no better results than lightly trained coaches, at least with most, most conditions. We would need to give up claiming expertise because of special experience with a population or diagnosis. For example, I'm an expert at chemical dependency or adolescence. We would need to stop inventing new systems and attending workshops to learn new techniques. We would need to admit that the vast majority of books and articles written about mental health have failed to enhance outcomes and therefore can be ignored. Most of all, we would have to figure out why psychotherapy isn't like medicine and develop a new direction that would actually score above 55%. The next step is to figure out why psychotherapy is so different than medicine. We all know that most professional fields, like chemistry or biology, find it easy to develop techniques with inherent power and training programs that make a difference in outcomes. Why can't we? What is the role of social constructionism? The next video explores how psychotherapy is different than those other professions and why it has been so challenging to pursue our evolution via traditional methods.